Welcome back to my Mental Health and Crime channel. This is the case of the idol quadruple murders. This is for entertainment purpose only. This is the traffic stop of Brian Christopher Koberger. The female cop stopped him in front of Washington Pullman. I think the university, Washington University. This is his insurance, I believe. It's going to expire on the 22nd of November. And he was stopped, I believe, somewhere in October. I wanted to compare Brian Christopher Koberger's voice with the young man called Dave who called in T-Rev because he said that some Sigma Ch Chi or Sigma Chi fraternity boys asked him if they we're going to unlive someone, how would they get away with it? Let's not forget that Brian Christopher Koberger did a research when he was doing his bachelor's in psychology, I think criminal psychology. He put out a research in Reddit asking criminals to join in. He had questions like, did you plan it before you committed the murders? How did you feel? Did you clean up after you? Questions like that. But I heard from a professor on Creme TV saying that it's quite normal, the research for criminology students. But he was doing psychology at that time, and I know in mental health that is not, that is quite abnormal. To start with, when we do our dissertation and we have to do research, we have to get it, we have to get the confirmation from the university. So the topic has to be something that is suitable something that is mindful, respectful, something that doesn't trigger up the clients, our clients, slash patient, patients. For whatever purpose he did the research, I was wondering if he actually got candidates to participate in it, like the Sigma Chi fraternity boys. I was wondering what if Brian Christopher Koberger is involved, but the reason that they can't get any blood evidence is because he didn't commit the crimes. He told the Sigma Chi boys how to do it, and he could have possibly lent them his Kaba knife that had his such DNA. So let's listen to his voice here, and then we compare it to T. Reeves. One. Well. I am Officer Melanius. Stop's being audio and video recorded. Again, no, I think you know why I stopped you. You were in the red light. What actually happened was I was stuck in the middle of the intersection. Yeah, so I, was I was behind you the whole left. time. Yeah. Yeah. So technically, you're not supposed to enter the intersection at all for that reason, because if the light turns red, then you're stuck in the intersection, and then you're on the red light. So that's the reason I stopped you. Do you have your license on you? Yep. Do you have the registration and insurance? Let me just get this for you out. Do what? I'm just going to get this out for you. Okay. So can you 
would you explain that to me a little bit further? So in Pennsylvania, when you're stuck like in that intersection, mm -hmm. you have to make the left. So what would what would the appropriate thing for me to have done? Not, just, just you're not supposed situation? to block an intersection like that in Washington. So sure. just by you blocking the intersection, that's technically a ticketable violation. And then thus, then you're running a red light, so it's another ticketable offense. So you're not supposed to proceed into the intersection until you can go, because a lot of people do what you just did, right? It's like you're sitting in the intersection waiting, and then it turns, and then you're blocking, so. Yeah, there was a little bit of confusion with speeding because someone had stopped. I wasn't sure what they were doing, and then they put on their light to turn. Mm -hmm. So I thought that maybe they were letting me go through. Oh. Did you see that? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like right before I made the turn, there was someone who like, made a right. They didn't have their, you know, their signal on, so I wasn't sure if they were just waiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would just advise uh, just don't enter the intersection until you can go so you don't get stuck. Um, let's see. But in that situation, the best thing to do then would be back up. Not. I don't know if there's a best thing to do in that situation because you're either going to back up into somebody yeah. or you're going to run a red light. So, or you're going to be sitting in an intersection. Yeah. There's not really a great option there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was just slightly into the crosswalk, so, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, where I'm from Pennsylvania, we mm -hmm. actually don't have, like, crosswalks. Oh, so even if you're, if you're kind of slightly, they have, there's a little bit more leeway as well. Like, there are a few lines, if there's one white line there's another one mm -hmm. like there's like a, like a certain yeah. margin from which you can actually kind of put your vehicle up, place your vehicle mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah so I know laws vary state to state but there is a law yeah. in Washington for blocking an intersection like that proceeding through yeah. and you know um, when you're just stalling I forget the actual verbiage I can find it for you but it's like stalling blocking an intersection yeah. I'm just curious about the law I don't need to oh no yeah I can yeah, find it for you yeah mm -hmm. Um, one second. That looks good. On a I don't see Pennsylvania registration like at all. Okay, let's see. Expires November 22nd, or 2022. Okay. And... Yeah, one of those is actually... Yeah, okay, that looks good. I'll hand that back to you. I'm just going to go check your info. I'll try to find that uh, RCW, the law for you, and I'll be right back. Thank you. All right. I personally believe that Brian Christopher Koberger speaks in a very respectful manner, mindful, professional, professional professionalism. I see somebody who's trying to look, learn the laws in Washington Pullman because it's from Pennsylvania. This call was made to T-Rev, his channel. Please like, share, and subscribe to him. This is for fair use purpose. I wanted to compare the man that calls in. He says his name is Dave. I wanted to compare Dave's voice to Brian Christopher Koberger's voice. I wonder if Brian Christopher Koberger didn't commit the quadruple murders, but he knew who did it, the Sigma Chi fraternity boys and the other people around, and he could have helped them by lending them the K-bar knife. And you could have found out later on that they forgot the knife sheet there. It's just a thought. Dave. Hey, what's up, Dave? You lie. Hey, what's up, man? Is this t -Rev? Yes, sir. What's going on? Not much, man. I just, I found you today. I, I watched your live earlier this afternoon and been watching uh this one and i uh the thing that that strikes me kind of weird about all this is that i live in a college town and i've worked with uh probably 
at least 10 Sigma Chi members. And, you know, the one thing that every single one of them, I, I, I feel like has asked me is, if you were going to kill somebody, how would you get away with it? And I just wonder if maybe, if maybe this is nothing more than some kid in a fraternity trying to prove himself. And that was it. So you said some, you worked with five or six Sigma Chi kids and they asked you how, if you can kill somebody, they can get away with it? Yeah. Did I hear that right? Yeah. Oh and my God. I know that's a thing that just like maybe people say, trying to like have interesting conversation, but like, just in my head, it's like, this is, it's always been these, these dudes that were in, in the fraternity. Hmm. And, and so it makes me wonder if it's a thing that that's in their, in their like culture that they ask to see how smart you are and whatever, and what kind of answer you come up with. And someone took it too far. Oh, uh, who, uh, what what kind of dudes would ask you that? Well, that that's that's crazy as shit, man. That's a, that's an outrageous statement, man. I, I'm a, I'd write their names down. Yeah, man. Like I, uh, like I, like you know, I like horror movies and all that kind of stuff, and I watch those kind of things. But like when someone like in person says some stuff like that, it's kind of like jarring. It's like, what? Why are you saying stuff Stop like that? Cow. It's very, uh, it's, it's a very unusual situation uh, that we have on our hands here. The crime scene itself, uh, what was seemingly and apparently random. Uh, and now we have a young man, Larry Kobolinski, 28 years of age, uh, who has studied criminology for a long time uh, and is a very uh, even demeanor, according to authorities, while in custody and only asking a single question as reported, has anyone else been arrested? How does it complicate the analysis of dealing with someone with his kind of skills and background? Well, it's hard because he studied criminal justice, obviously, and he studied, studied crime. Uh, and he's even done surveys uh, to see uh, how people felt as they were committing crimes. Uh, it seems that what I heard in this TikTok presentation is that he was into drugs, even as a young person. And this might explain the rage and the passion and the, the terrible stabbing that, uh, that he did uh, to these four students. Uh, and this might explain the rage and the passion and the, the terrible stabbing that, uh, that he did uh, to these four students. Uh, and he may have been on stimulants. Uh, he may have progressed from heroin, which is more down, uh, to amphetamines and cocaine and things of that sort. And that might explain the, the viciousness of the attack. At the end of the day, we only know what authorities can show. Uh, and as tantalizing as it may be, his background, uh, his criminology studies, and how he appears in pictures and from reports, they're going to have to show what for this to stick. Well, they're going to have to show that it was, they, they believe they're charging him with first degree. So they're going to have to show that it was premeditated, that it wasn't a situation where he just ended up in that room. There was a scuffle and this terrible scene happened. They're going to have to show that this was planned in order for a first degree murder conviction to stick. And I think that the autopsy reports showing that these victims were likely asleep when they were first stabbed, at least, uh, which is absolutely terrible. Uh, I think that that's going to take care of that, uh, the chance that anybody could argue that it wasn't premeditated, because obviously if you're going and stabbing people that are sleeping, you've, you, there's only really one reason to do that. So um, I think just with those bare facts, it's a very, very strong case for a first degree argument. I, I don't think that there's much that a defense is going to be able to argue 
that it wasn't premeditated. Now, getting into the history of drugs, the long history of drugs, obviously, since he was in high school, maybe even before then, there could very well be um, a mental health defense. There could be a, a, um, a, a defense about he didn't have the capacity at the time to form that intent. And that's where the argument is going to be, for sure. Like, literally, like, I, I, before I even called, I counted on my hand, on my hands, like, how many of these guys I can remember that I worked with at this bar, and there's like 10 of them. I swear that, that question has always come up, and it could just be nothing, like, maybe people say that, but I just kind of, it makes me wonder if that's a part of that thing, and like, someone just took that question and that, that idea and like took it too far, like, oh, I'm gonna prove to these guys that I'm in the club or whatever. So let me hear this right. You said you were working with six Sigma Chi guys and they said they, how could they get away with killing somebody? Yeah, more like 10, but they would say that to me. They would say like, you are if you were gonna kill somebody, how would you get away with that? And you know, what are these guys' names? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not gonna. Let me get like, names come out. on, drop two or three of them, first and last. First and last. That's a that's a broad statement. I mean, you're calling me with this information when you should be on the phone with the police. Well, this, I'm in a I'm in a different state. I, I don't care if you're in Mexico. If that's the case, and the people from the Sigma Chi told you that they're gonna. That they, how could you get away with murder? I mean, I'd be on the phone telling them that. Well, I think they were, I think, I guess what, what I'm trying to say is maybe it's like an exercise of like, uh, you know, if you were going to make pasta for a hundred people, how would you like prepare? How would you like execute that? Like, it's not like they're actually asking you cause they want to do it. It's more like, a. Yeah, how smart are you? How good are you? That That's what I'm getting at, is that maybe they're saying, I'm going to present you with this question and see, like, how, uh, you know, uh, capable you are, like, with problem solving and this and that. And maybe somebody at that fraternity took that question and and took it too far. So you're saying... So, so you were saying you were in Moscow? No, I wasn't in Moscow. No, I'm in I'm in a different state. So, but uh, you're saying you're in a different state, but you just said Sigma Chi house people. That's how they would get away with murder. So, how would somebody ask you that if you're in a different state? Where, where, did, where did that come from? I, I guess what you I'm from five I, to I, ten. So, I mean, it's it, honestly, it's, it it doesn't even say it sounds inconsistent. No, I no, I, I worked with at least ten. Sigma Chi members, but it was in a different state, not from that, not in Moscow, in a different state. I'm just saying maybe the culture of that fraternity, like they have questions that they ask and maybe somebody took that question too literally and too seriously as a way to prove themselves. And what do, what do you all think? Could that be Brian Christopher Koberger? You could have a voice change or something, a way to change his voice. Because Brian Christopher Koberger speaks very softly. You all saw that when he was speaking to the police officer, the woman. And this Dave guy seems to be speaking softly too. So if this was Brian, and if if he's telling the truth, then it makes sense that he could have lent them his knife. That's how the knife sheet got there, and it was the Sigma Chi boys who committed the crimes. He was waiting outside, or he passed by because he remembered that they didn't give him the knife sheet. 
because we heard Chris Como saying in News Nation, though it ain't the best sources, but Brian Christopher Kobag allegedly said, has anyone else been arrested? I believe the Sigma Chi fraternity boys are involved because of the four figures running. And the boys in Banfield, Stop and Saeed, whatever he is watching, look like Kaylee sitting in the position her mother and father spoke about. May she rest in peace. Let me know if you think this is Brian. Because I believe that thought makes a bit sense. You could have done that research that he did on Reddit and got participants from there. Look at this car. It is a Hyundai, I believe. This car was always in front of Jack D's house. And look at that. SUV behind or the truck or whatever it is. It looks quite all right. I wonder if that is what Enan Hash was talking about that night that he saw. This was the Hyundai Elantra that was seen near the gas station. You can see it has tinted windows. And this looks like the car, the Hyundai that is parked in front of Jack D's house. You see Jack D on the roof. And you see Adam downstairs and somebody else. I wonder if the black SUV is what Enon could have been talking about. And then you see that white pickup. vehicle at the left the first one that one looks like the one that was driving towards the corner club when Kaylee Maddie and Jack Schultz were walking so there are three vehicles in front of his house. At least on this side, right in front of his house. I wonder if that white Hyundai was used, or whichever car it may be. How come Murphy wasn't hurt? He was barking. Usually a killer Trigger warning doesn't bother about a pet or about a human being because they're in the process of unliving anyone and everything, even a pet, they can come in the way of being caught. So how come Murphy had no DNA on him? Did the killer know Murphy? The police don't even know if Murphy was taken out to the scene and brought out later. But when the police arrived, Murphy was in Kaylee's room. And I believe Kaylee was sleeping in her room, actually. She heard Maddie yelling, and she came to check, and something happened there. She ended up in the bed on the sitting position while defending herself. Poor victims, may the rest in peace. Why was Jack D the last person to be ruled out? Trigger warning. Talking about large knife. Find this picture to be very interesting. Even if she took it for fun, why would you take pictures with knives and masks? What is wrong with Dylan? This is just my opinion and thoughts. She seems to have a 
a scary side of her. What was Dylan and Bethany Funk actually doing when the murders happened? Because the chief said the surviving roommates are not witness. They were just there. That is what he clearly said in the first press conference. Dylan was supposed to be sleeping downstairs in the first floor. But after 49 days, Brian Christopher Coburg was arrested and Dylan was said to be a witness sleeping on the second floor. How could he change that so quickly? From first floor to second floor, Dylan was sleeping, but now she's awake and she witnessed a man with bushy eyebrows, athletically built. built. The house is old, it makes noises, and Dylan's trying to say she wasn't afraid. She opened the door thrice. Could one of the surviving roommates have let the person in? Because I find it strange that there are two surviving roommates, that they were not targets, and Murphy was alive. Could this have been something that happened inside with the roommates? Allegedly, I'm just asking. But this is really concerning because this is not the first time Dylan is seen with knives and sharp objects. I have plenty of them, but I don't need to get a strike from YouTube. But this is just something to think about. Why did Xander want to change the locks? Was she threatened by one of us roommates, one of the surviving roommates? Or was she threatened by the surviving roommates' his boyfriends, like Quinn, Quincy? Something wasn't right. This is one of the three unidentified male DNAs. Was there a struggle in the living room? Because the good vibes is in the living room and there's one in Katie's room but this one was the one in the living room the glove outside is the second and the van shoe print latin shoe print is the third the knife sheet is the main one Was BK involved? It's important to ask those questions because I personally believe that either BK was somehow involved by maybe participating in the research that he made allegedly and he conducted it and led these people on live the students, that's a possibility. If it's true, BK asked if there was anyone, if the others were arrested, then I really believe that BK did not do these crimes. He sent these boys to do the crimes because they had beef, anger, revenge, for the three targets, Maddie, Zana, and Eaton. Jovita and Hoodie Guy, Jack Schwalter must have really irritated Maddie. This is when she points her finger towards Jovita and she says, you miss her. Then she says the F word, the F bomb. Kaylee was trying to avoid looking at Schwalt. Hi, Heather Roberts of ABC News. Just to follow up on what she asked, so the other two roommates were there at the time of the attack? 
All the information that we have from our investigation is that yes, they were. Okay, but they were unhurt. That is correct. So is there any explanation as to why it took so long then for someone to call 911? You have surviving witnesses to an incident at 3 or 4 in the morning and the 911 call didn't come until noon? I don't think I ever said that they were witnesses. I said they were there. Um, so, you know, we don't know why that call came in at noon and not um, in the middle of the night. Um, would have we loved for that to have happened? Yes, but that, that's not how it took place. So. Um, we're, that's why we're investigating everything still to try to pull all the pieces together. Were they one of the people, were, were they the 911 caller? Uh, at this point in time, um, I'm not going to divulge who our 911 caller is, um, just because I want to keep the um, integrity of the investigation at this point. Okay. Okay. And last question, are you able to tell whether the same weapon was used on all four victims? You know, that's why we're having the autopsies done. The autopsy will confirm that and hopefully collect um, some evidence for us, um, even from from those. That's what you do. Um, the autopsies is to try to be thorough and try to gather more. So um, we'll leave that. That, that. that would probably be something that would come out later. I found this post on New York Post. A former university professor, Brian Koberger, said, the accused killer was one of my best students ever and that then master's candidate was only of of only two students she has recommended to a PhD program. Imagine that. He was one of one of her best students and he was one of the only two that she recommended in the PhD program. Michelle Burger, thirty three and associated professor Professor at Diesel's University in Pennsylvania told the Daily Mail that Koberger, who was arrested in the murders of four University of Idaho students, was a great writer and brilliant student. See, we're learning something new about Koberger. In my 10 years of teaching, I've only recommended two students to a PhD program, and he was one of them. He was one of my best students ever. Everyone is in shock over this, she told the outlet, adding that he was always perfectly professional with her. Yes, she is perfect. Yeah. So it is the Catholic school he went to in D cells. And he does seem to be very respectful when he talks because let's not forget he's been accused he's been charged with these murders but he hasn't been sentenced or anything for these murders and I'm glad they asked to change their revenue because I think this is too close to home to the victim's place People have already judged Koberger in the world without even knowing him or knowing his past history. I do understand that he's had drug ad addiction, but that doesn't make him any less of a person. Although that could have caused him mental health issues, allegedly. But he managed to come back after his addiction and re rehabilitation, he came back, finished his, finished his master's and then his PhD program. Just because he didn't have friends or many friends or anything like that, it doesn't make him or incel or anything like that. People have judged him too quickly from the beginning when the timeline doesn't even make sense. I've always believed that Koberger definitely has something to do with this because of his phone being switched off, him being around the area, but the question is, did he go inside the house and unlike the four people? Or was he part of helping these people to conduct his, re 
to help him to basically to help Koberger sorry I mean Koberger would be helping them to to live their fantasies like the 4chan article said that the two Davids especially David B talked a lot about enlivening people and death and all these things and David Lot had beef with E and Zano could they have borrowed Brian Christopher Koberger's knife and they forgot the knife sheet on purpose so that they could put the blame on him. That makes him guilty too, but that means the others involved who actually did the unlivings. And I find it interesting that Murphy and the two surviving roommates were unharmed. This is the professor who said Brian Christopher Koberger was the best student. She said she only recommended two students in the PhD program and he was one of them. That was in DeSales University, a private Catholic university in Centre Valley, Pennsylvania. I wonder if Ann Taylor got enough evidence from the house before it was demolished. He was going for his PhD studies at Washington State University. Um, with your background in, in criminology, is there anything that you can share in terms of the suspect? Does it make sense with somebody that you thought like aligned with a potential suspect profile, I guess walk me through um, this this major development in the case uh, with your knowledge in the subject. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing that's interesting about this as somebody who got my PhD in criminology and justice in 2018 and is now a professor in the field, you know, a lot has been made of this research study that has um, been has come out from Reddit that he reportedly and many news outlets are saying that he was part of saying, you know, oh, this is so creepy. This is very eerie. And I recognize why that would look eerie. But in our field, that study is actually very par for the course. So in criminology, the interest is in motivation and understanding why people commit all types of crimes, right? So that study in and of itself does not necessarily raise any red flags. Um, I currently teach a media crime and justice class. Many of my students are very, very interested in, um, you know, why people commit crime, serial killers, all sorts of things like that. I myself took a serial killers and psychopaths class in my master's degree program. And, you know, the whole class was very interested in the topic. So interest alone is not necessarily a red flag. Um, what it does tell me about him is that he likely has a strong understanding of the criminal justice system here in the United States. And he likely has a strong understanding of what's going to be coming next. Um, he very likely understands the media attention that is going to be brought to him and to this case. And so, you know, as somebody who studies media and crime, I'm definitely kind of bracing myself for this next part, because this is the part of the case where generally so much focus goes to him and what motivated him and his interest in his life story. And, you know, I'm very worried that the victims are going to be lost in this part of the story. I wonder if the killers or the killer was waiting, hiding and waiting in that room on the first floor because the forensics was using their brush on the windows and the police, the detectives are studying the windows. Kaylee's bed was in a room it looks like there's a duvet on the bed. 
and Murphy was sleeping in Kaylee's room. So why would Kaylee be sleeping on the single bed with Maddie when they both could have been sleeping on the king bed with Kaylee? Doesn't make sense. And there was lights out on the veranda. Who would have the audacity and the guts to come in when they know it's a party house, it's always crowded. There are five roommates who lived here. The sixth roommate did not move in, allegedly. And there was Murphy the dog. And you have Hunter and half of the Sigma Chai fraternity boys always opening the door for the police. So this had to be pre-planned and it was targeted. And I believe it was two separate incidents. The couple was killed somewhere between 2 a.m. to quarter past two. And I believe Kayla and Maddie came home and saw something, definitely. They must have seen maybe the couple and lived. And Maddie must have run out towards Taylor Avenue, that's how her coat got there, a black coat. That's just my thoughts, speculating, nothing else. This is, this is definitely not facts, but it could make sense. Kaylee and Maddie made a couple of calls, 10 calls to Jack D. We heard a female yelling, stop it, stop. After that, that was 2.54. And then at 12 past 2, we see four figures running from this direction to the Sigma Chi fraternity. It's good that BK asked for a change of court revenue. Definitely, because this case is so high profile, I don't believe he's going to get a fair trial in later county. It's heartbreaking. May the, rest, the victims rest in peace. Please like, share and subscribe.